Rebecca, hello, how are you doing? Um, I'm good, I'm good. I'm, I'm drinking lots of strong coffee, so I'm a bit wired, but yeah, fine other than that. <laughs> This is my first coffee of the day, so I haven't I haven't started wiredness yet, but it's on its way, I think. Cheers. Cheers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm aware that you're super busy at the moment working on HistFest, um, so thank you for taking time out to, to join us. Um, in a minute, I'll ask you to give us an overview of your, of your work and to introduce yourself, but would you let us know about HistFest, first of all, for listeners who are new to that? Uh, yeah, which is, made, to be honest, at the moment, that is my work. Um, so HistFest was a festival that was set up in 2018 to um, rectify what I believe has been decades long um, problem in representation when it comes to history festivals. So we have lots, um, we have loads more women. Um, we, we, we cover LGBTQ histories and um, histories of people of colour. Um, we do loads and loads of stuff. Um, but unfortunately this year our festival was to, supposed to take place this weekend. Um, and uh, it had to be cancelled, um, obviously, and um, had to be cancelled because of the outbreak. Um, you were going to be there as well. So instead of that, I've kind of, I should have thought about this a long while ago, but I um, decided to put together a digital festival, which is happening today. But um, today is in Friday, the 3rd, which is probably gone now. But you can watch the content if you like. It's the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we'll talk through some of the things you've already said, but may I ask you then to introduce yourself and to give us an overview of your work, both as someone thinking about history in public, and then also if you have time, tell us about your research as well. We'd love to hear about that. Um, so I'm a bit of a jack of all trades, master of none. Um, the only thing that I can claim to have any level of expertise in is very specifically the year 1666. <laughs> <laughs> what is the title of your book on that topic? Remind me. Well, 1666. <laughs> <laughs> you, if you had to read in this time, then, you know, get, go for it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I do study the restoration. I'm, I research it. I, I'm always hesitant to say that I'm an expert just because I don't yet have a PhD and I'm trying to and as soon as I do I will be shouting from the hills like, I'm an expert um but yeah I'm I that's my area um, I'm I mean you know sorry to interrupt you but you know I feel strongly about the fact that you very definitely are an expert and um you are leading the way both in the scholarship that you do but also in the championing of scholarship in public that you do so I'm sorry to interrupt but I'm not having that <laughs> my head's getting big um, thank you um, yeah, I just love, I love anything to do in the 17th century, to be perfectly honest, and um, I could talk about it forever, so I will stop there. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically it, and I do organise public events and do public things as well, um, just because I'm a big procrastinator, and I like doing things when I'm supposed to be doing other things, like writing a book, um, but yeah, that's me. Yeah, thank you. And you're being super modest in lots of different ways. And for me, that it isn't procrastination to, um, if you're aware that you're going to be um, taking time to do the writing side of, of your work, which sometimes happens for me as well, um, then what you're doing is making really wonderful, pragmatic and generous decisions about what else to do with that time where you would otherwise not be working on your book, which is enabling other scholarship to reach new audiences. Um, and the, the whole profession owes you a massive debt of gratitude for that. Stop. Stop this, it's too much. No. Oh, it's every time you're self effacing, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back at you with a compliment. How's that? That's a deal. In the video so far, we've talked quite a bit about um representation and diversity and um silence and archival absence. So in other words, we talked quite a bit about how the archives um at first at least make it hard to recover diverse histories and center um, powerful white male dead people. Um, but I suppose you're pointing us towards both that historical issue, but a much more live and contemporary and pressing issue, which is that the way that that um, historical research is mediated and who gets to talk about it is an issue too. Um, I, I keep asking very general questions in these videos, but would you mind just telling us a bit more about either sides of those work or the challenge of the two together? Yeah, I mean, it's tricky because I'm sat, I'm you know sat here as 
a white female as well and we're both talking about an issue of you know issues of diversity so there's only so much that that can be said you just have to recognize where there are you know recognize privilege and do what you can to make sure you're aware of that and not replicate mistakes that people have made for decades and when you are you know if you are aware of it call people out when they're you know or politely say you know you're not you're not giving space to for everybody to be part of you know to sit at the table and it's um i guess that's it for me um yeah I, again it's a, it's a it's a difficult one to discuss sitting here as a i mean i'm, I'm a northerner but i'm so that's slightly rare but that's you know it's not really anything and um, in terms of the archive and um, when you're looking for histories that often are neglected um some of my big heroes are people like people that write popular history. So um, Antonia Fraser, I love her, and I love the book that she wrote about the um, weaker vessel. I mean, some of the research is obviously dated now, but it's just the way it's her approach. I love it. And um, Halle Rubenhold is amazing in everything that she does. Um, so I love the, this idea of recovering histories. I've not done it so much in my own work. I have recovered the voices of. I don't want to use working class because it, those kind of brackets don't really apply to the 17th century in the way that we view them today but people that you only have records of them through parish registers and they haven't left any written material behind i enjoy the detective work of trying to bring those lives you know give a fuller picture to those lives so i'm i, I don't even know if that's answering your question but it's um yeah that, that's that <laughs> no that does answer my question and um you're right that between the two of us, we don't, we don't embody full diversity, but then that's the nature of diversity itself, isn't it? Is that you can't ask a, a small number of people to represent it. And I think what's so exciting about what you're doing is the enabling of this massive pool of people um, bringing together um, diverse voices and new voices to, to new audiences. And that's what, that, that's what feels really exciting about, about HistFest. Do you mind telling us a bit about the... Um, the kind of process of HISFEST itself, either about the challenges of that kind of work, opportunities, um, what mm. you get out of it, what stops you from doing what you'd like to do with it. Uh, <laughs> that's four <Money>. questions. <laughs> yeah, that's what doing what I'd like to do with it. Um, if I, yeah, it would be wonderful to have a huge sponsor. Lots of festivals join together with um, newspapers and, and things and they get you know sponsorship that way it, we're small fry compared to any other festival so that's not on the horizon anytime soon but ho hopefully maybe in you know four or five years time that might happen um, the challenges are um, and I'll be honest they are all rooted in financial challenges without money you cannot employ other people to do work so when you haven't got the, the funds um, behind you I end up doing a lot of the stuff and I won't even admit the scale of the, the work that I do because it's huge and it's also, you know, it, it's fine. I enjoy it, um, but it would be great to have a bigger team and that would be something that I'd, you know, I'm hoping that we can perhaps achieve next year, maybe. Um, but yeah, the challenges as well or making sure that you've got a good lineup if you're putting on an event. And I'm saying this in the full knowledge that I created a great lineup and it, it hasn't happened yet because the festival is cancelled. Um, pandemics, they tend to be a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I heard it here first. <laughs> um, the pleasure from doing it is bringing together people from different disciplines. Um, so what I really liked about the first festival was, and you were there as well, was the fact that we had popular historians there, we had academics there and filmmakers, anybody basically that touches history in any way, shape or form, was at the festival talking together and on panels together. I remember um, very vividly that you were, you as an academic, you're a great public speaker, but you are an academic as well. I don't know why I put a butt in there. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, and your talk, Philippa Gregory wanted to listen to what you had to say. So you, you know, you came after her, and people have, you know, people have conversations about Philippa Gregory's work and also the work of historical fiction and how that sometimes muddies the waters when it comes to truth and facts and all of that. But at the end of the day, we're all interested in history, and these conversations, you know, they benefit everybody. I think so. Yeah, um, that's one of the pleasures of doing it, um, and also it's a buzz. It's an adrenaline buzz when it's going on as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I got so much out of um, appearing at that festival um, and met lots of fascinating and exciting people, but I certainly didn't expect Philippa Gregory to be chasing me down the stairs afterwards, wanting to talk about widows and the business lives of widows who inherit their husband's businesses. It was a really exciting conversation, and I, I think that went straight into some of the work she was doing for her book, which is not that long out. Um, really? And so you set up a wonderful opportunity for hopefully her, but certainly for me, there um, of contact that I otherwise would never have had. That was really exciting. So hang on, your research into widows is going into her book, or she's. I don't want to. I don't want to put it too concretely in case that's just not true. But um, certainly, we had a conversation <laughs> about. Has inspired the work book, I should say. Yeah, she was. She was really working on the subject herself, and I, I suspect me far more than I did. Um, but was interested in some of the work we were doing on um, women who set up playhouses in Shakespeare's lifetime. So that was very exciting. Ah. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what it means to practice history in public, if that's a good way of putting it? So. Um, why, why aren't you the sort of person, this sounds, uh, this sounds like an aggressive question, but I don't mean it like that, but you know, why, why, are, why, um, why walk away from the model of scholar in, in research archive writing a book for two people? Uh, oh dear, that sounds, uh, in, in trying not to be rude about anyone else, I ended up being rude about everyone. But um, uh, yeah, what does it mean to be practicing history publicly? I don't know. I, I, I've, I've never really... I don't, I don't think of myself as being an academic um, in any way. And I know you've said, oh, yeah, I, am, I am and things, but I, I don't think of myself as, and I don't think many people think of themselves in that way. You think of, you, you want your work to be shared. Um, and I always wanted to be a writer. So writing is my main thing. And if I can get my writing out there and get people reading it, that's, that's great. Um, I enjoy talking to people. It comes with risks, though. I think there's you, you can get a lot of, I mean, we've had conversations about this in private, um, and you can get a lot of abuse for the most, you know, benign comments, but, um, and that can be quite hurtful and can, um, I don't know, I've, I've had a few rough periods because of things like that, um, mental health-wise and, and stuff. But overall, I just like sharing things that I'm passionate about, passionate about, not just history. Yeah, I, I'm really interested in um, literature and culture and films, historical films. I love writing, I having the opportunity to write about historical drama that's on TV as well, which I've done a few times now. So it's just, it's a privilege and a pleasure, but it does come with some drawbacks. And um, the drawbacks are around kinds of gatekeeping, which I guess is one of the reasons why I'm, um, I'm resistant to the idea of whether someone is or isn't an academic because quite often that's that is the issue on which some of the slightly stranger reactions to public history turn on is a kind of gatekeeping who does and doesn't belong in my field and who gets to speak for the past uh, which again is, is where this conversation started right with Histvest who gets to speak for the past. Yeah and I, I do understand I mean if I see somebody talking about the Great Plague for example which is something that I've studied extensively and um, I do kind of think hmm, maybe well, I'd quite like to talk about that instead and you do kind of <laughs> agree. I do understand like I do understand that feeling when you when you feel that someone else is talking about something that you know but at the end of the day you have to accept that nobody nobody owns history we all have different interpretations of what happened in the past and we're all coming to it with different views and um, levels of expertise so you know Let's all be able to talk about it. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. Um, so if it's okay, Rebecca, to turn to to your research, um, you mentioned mm. the Great Plague there, which is suddenly feeling weirdly uh, topical. Um, how great was the Great Plague? Would you say <laughs> <laughs> scale of one oh, to ten? Bloody amazing! Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Summer of sixteen sixty-five. Um, no. It, <laughs> It was the it was the great. I don't know. It's a hard question. How do you measure great? And um, certainly, there had been other plagues that had been considered to be great, and great as in large, not you know, fun. Um, sixteen o three and um, the plagues that were around during the um, Jacobean Jacobean period when Shakespeare was writing um, were particularly notorious. And actually, there's arguments to be said to be had that proportionally more people died during these earlier plagues than during. The Great Plague of 1665, 
Um, but I guess, I guess the bare facts, and people, if anyone's watching this and they're an early modernist, they will know these things already. So, <clears throat> excuse me, and I apologise. Um, but we're around 450 people living in London, 450,000 people, I should say, living in London in 1665, mm. roughly around 100,000, we think, died. So, I mean, the hit rate, it was pretty high. Also, you have to remember that 450,000 people were living in London in normal circumstances so loads of people would have left so yeah i mean it was it was pretty huge um and great great uh, we're going to stick to that word the greatest yeah. hits of the plague um so for anyone listening to this who's not an early modernist and is new to thinking about the mid-17th century um how can we kind of pinpoint 1666 for them i mean my, my first instinct is to think about the fact that this is the period immediately after um England has no monarch and has been dreaming of itself as a non a non monarchy, something which uh, now feels. I feel like our country has an odd relationship with that period of history because we walked away from it. Um, yeah, yeah, how can we pinpoint that moment in history? Uh, ooh. I don't know. I think this is one of the reasons why I'm really interested in the 17th century because it literally has everything, um, and. It's like, I often think about, and this isn't the 17th century, but I often think about my great grandfather um, who was born in 1898, um, fought in the First World War, and then fought in the Second World War when he was in his 40s, late 40s. And I often think, what kind of view of life would you have if those were your defining experiences? I mean, we're lucky enough, our generation, to have grown up you know, with, I mean, our generation living in the, a, a cocoon in England or the UK, to have grown up without that many huge events directly affecting us. Um, but yeah, I, a, a lot of people in England during the 17th century would have lived through the, the civil wars, then they would have seen their king have his head chopped off. There was ideas of, um, that people were living in their last age as well. The, the, this big biblical idea that Armageddon was on its way, and this wasn't just you know a passing fancy. People really did believe that this could be happening. I mean, J James the First even wrote about the end, the end of days. Um, so it was a very, it's a very curious time. And then I think by the time it gets to the Restoration, people are just like, you know what? Let's just chill for a bit. Um, and then you have the Great Plague happening and the Great Fire of London and the, the three wars with the um, with the Dutch that are often forgotten about. Um, and then lots of things that happened during the reign of Charles II that if they'd happened in the early part of the 17th century, I think it would have cost him his throne. But people were scarred by, by war and, and, and trauma and things. So I don't know, I'm not sure whether that answers your question, but um, I, I guess in a nutshell, in the mid 17th century, there was just a lot going on. Yeah, I, I, I love the idea that this is the period in which people said let's chill out a bit and if any listeners are wondering if that's a direct quote that is a direct quote from the period isn't it um and um there's a, i mean we talked to eleanor yanaga the other day about uh, medieval sex positivity and it feels like that this is a period also of quite radical sex positivity certainly in relationship to what was happening five ten years uh, before 1666 or 50 years before 1666, which were much more sort of no sex at all, thank you very much times, um, that sex is suddenly part of a public conversation in a way that it hadn't been before, part of court gossip in a way that it hadn't been before, um, part of a kind of remapping of London and um, spaces for leisure like St James's Park, for example, uh, but London itself becomes weirdly sexy. Well, St James's Park, I mean, obviously we associate that with the famous poem by the Earl of Rochester, a ramble in St James's Park, when he talks about various bits of shrubbery and um, doing things to the sky. Um, but it's, I mean, you know, as well as I do, it's hard, it's hard to talk about how, how widely these things were discussed. I mean, certainly we have evidence from within the court that there was there's definitely affairs and you know everything going on but that happens in courts around the world you know forever and um, but this openness i suppose to the idea of um the king having mistresses he was very open about it and they you know they were famous um although actually having spoken to greg jenner recently about his about the idea of fame i don't think they were 
famous in the way that we would understand it today. Um, but they were known. Um, so there was that. There were kind of, you know, there's references in Peter's diary to some of the imagery that he had sticking up, kind of proto page three pictures in his little closet. Um, I don't know. It's 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 tricky. Then you find you find pamphlets as well. There's one pamphlet that I came across a while ago that was written or supposedly written by a woman, and she was talking. She was basically asking men to stop beating wives and treat them with respect. And obviously, the you know the emergence of the printed press and stuff, it gave it gave some room for people to talk about these types of things, often anonymously. And um, so, yeah, there were definitely conversations going on. Um, but what had been going on behind closed doors, I mean, it's always, it's, you know, but that's always been there. Um, so, yeah. Great. Again, I don't think I'm answering very well, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> great, it's great. Um, we were ending the videos by asking our contributors uh, what the word literature means to them, whether it's a, a useful word, word, an unhelpful word, um, whether it's a word that they would use professionally or personally. Do you mind telling us it means anything to you? The literature, I always, I always associate with novels. To be perfectly honest, I don't really associate with associate with his, history. And um, it's one of those words that that you're taught as a kid, and it sounds quite fancy. And you're taught you're taught it in relation to books, to novels, and that's how I I, I think about it. Also, in my mind, I'm thinking about literature in terms of pamphlets because I um. Obviously, this festival was supposed to happen. We get out the violins, um, and we were going to have literature, as I called it, on on seats for people to read. And I guess that's in my head as well. So it's not a very profound um, view on what literature is, but it's for me, it's escapism and novels, and um, you know, being whisked away somewhere by someone else's thoughts. Yeah, thank you. I mean, the second example you give of how you are thinking of literature in your current festival is a really lovely kind of snapshot of of where your mind is now. And I, you know, I like that. In a way, these videos are turning into kind of time capsules of our current moment. So that's really fascinating. And then to associate, associate it with novels, depending when you think novels begin as a historical phenomenon, uh, it's kind of interesting to think that the period that you work on is potentially pre-literary in that sense. Again, depending on when we think novels, novels start. Um, but I think that's really fascinating. Um, Rebecca, tell us again, finally, um, where can people go to find out about HistFest? Where should they be looking to follow along? Well, the website is um, histfest.org, um, and if you're, um, I'm assuming this will be out after today, which is Friday, um, but if you want to look back at some of the videos, they will all be on the YouTube channel, but go to histfest.org and then you can click on the link to our YouTube channel and you can watch all the videos that have hopefully been uploaded and hopefully it's been a great success. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if we can try and get this video up later today, so this is um, Friday the 3rd, as you say, so... We will try and see if we can get it out um, quicker and hopefully get some push more people towards the wonderful work that you're doing. Oh, well, you're all invited. It's free. It's free as well. You're all invited to come along. Great. Thank you. Good luck with that. And thank you for speaking to us. Thank you. Take care.